All right, welcome to the Q&A video. First of all, why did it take me so incredibly long to make a Q&A video? Because I did it once, maybe even twice already, and it was horrible. The light was horrible, the audio was horrible, um... everything was horrible, so we're fixing that today. Secondly, um, I don't know, was there a secondly? Secondly, thanks for all your questions. It was amazing. I was flooded with questions. Within 48 hours, I had over 50 questions. Uh, obviously, I can't answer all of those, but I picked the ones out that I think will cover a lot of the other questions as well. So hopefully, let's get through this. This is gonna be quite a boring, static video, but if you're interested in what I'm doing and if you wanna see what I'm gonna be doing in the future, then stay along for the ride. If you have any other questions, please leave them in the comments below. I will try. Uh, and answer every single one of them. I always read your comments and I love interacting with you guys. So that's the best way to get towards um, me. All right, let's get going. Question number one, tell me your story uh, from childhood to today becoming a photographer and who's your mentor and what's your future plans? Holy crap, that's a long question. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll try and get it, summarize it. I started off, I was very fortunate. We used to travel a lot with my parents. Um, I have been to Africa, America, Southeast Asia, Sri Lanka, these exotic places. Once a year we travel somewhere and I would go along with my parents and I would, you know, we'd be on a safari, we'd be cycling through Southeast Asia, crazy things. And it's, you know, it's because of my adventurous parents that were doing things that were a little bit off the beaten path and off the, the norm, I would say. Um, that I got to, you know, got that travel bug, got infested with uh, the desire to see the world. And we always obviously had a camera with us, a good old film camera. And I remember being on Safari in which I, I think I shot a whole roll of film just of lions. Uh, I just love taking photos of lions and wildlife. And it was just, it was the most amazing thing as a, you know, 20, this is 20 years ago when I was seven, six, seven, eight years old. Um, seeing lions in the wild was just mind blowing. So I think that's where I got my travel bug. The photography thing just came a little bit later. Um, I actually ended up studying science, maths, languages, all that kind of things uh, that have nothing to do with photography. I drifted away when I didn't know what to study when I was 18, so I joined the Belgian army. Uh, I'm originally from Belgium, guys, and I, I, I really had a great time. I mean, I never, I was fortunate. I never got to go to any war zone or anything like that. So I basically trained for three and a half, almost four years to go to war, but um, I was paid to go running six times a week, um, you know, go to the gym. We did all these kinds of fun stuff. Um, I was a paratrooper, so we jump out of planes. Um, cool times to be paid to do fun things. Um, I really enjoyed it. I ended up quitting the army. Uh, I, had, I saved a lot of money and together with a good friend, I traveled around the world. We set the goal to go around the world and do it in one year. That was that was like the, the rules for our travels and we went we did it. We went all around the world and that's where I really picked up photography and travel and combined them a little bit. It, it really connected those things that I do today and I think that's where I really figured out, hey, you know, this is something you can keep on doing. While we were traveling, I met my girlfriend, the yellow jacket model. She is from Australia. Her name is Freya. Um, in case you were wondering, because she's always a yellow jacket model. We had to pick to either live in Belgium or Australia. Um, which was a pretty easy decision. I packed my bags when I was 22 and left my life in Belgium or after traveling and uh, went to live in Australia. I figured, you know, this is a new opportunity, a new life. Try and do something that you really care about. So I did everything I could do to do photography. So I was shooting surfers. I was helping out another photographer shooting weddings, learning everything I could do on the internet. Started a blog as well. So the whole things that I'm doing now, I sort of started off again there. And I was shooting products pretty much full time and I started shooting more and more surf and I was shooting surf from sunrise until nine and then I was shooting products from nine to five or six o'clock and then I was shooting surf at sunset again. So it was, it was long days of using cameras, but I really, really wanted to do this. So I, I, I did it nonstop and I you know started shooting more and more surf and I landed the internship with Chris Burkhardt the Californian photographer that I really looked up to, a young guy, really successful, probably one of the most successful surf photographers, in my opinion, um, out there back then. I, I think I followed his path a little bit. When I did the internship for him, I basically moved away from Australia. My girlfriend came with me and we spent four months in California right next to his studio. I bought a van. I basically gave up everything I had in Australia to do this. I learned so much from Chris. I'm really thankful for what I've I, I learned there. After that, we continued traveling. So my girlfriend and I met traveling. So traveling is really the thing we love doing, which is uh, why we started a travel blog in the meantime. And 
we are basically looking at doing this full time. So I do the photography and she does the writing on the blog. So check it out if you love travel or if you want to learn about the places that you see in my photos, you'll definitely find uh, guides about there and stories and all things, the background information, how to get yourself there as well. So check it out on thesandyfeet.com. I'll put the link in the description. That's led me to starting using Olympus cameras as well. I wanted something lighter, something more compact, especially for surf photography. I was logging around about 20 kilos of camera gear, which, you know, is pretty difficult to travel with on a long-term basis. Ditched the Canon stuff I had, picked up the EM1 with a housing, um, and started documenting my surf photography and somehow caught the attention of Olympus Australia and at the same time wrote about my experience of transitioning to a smaller camera, to a mirrorless camera from Canon to Olympus and all that stuff. And obviously as a camera brand, that's really interesting material for them. So that's how I started off with them. And then the internship with Chris taught me that I had to go a little bit beyond surf photography if I wanted to expand and make a living out of this because surf photography is a quite small market. And I still love doing it. I love going out in the elements, swimming with my housing and just being completely beat around by the, uh, the water and the waves and just being out there. It's probably one of the, my favorite ways of taking photos. So I started shooting a little bit more on land and um, I'm, I was born in the country. So I had to combine my roots and my, my past with my photography and my future. So I, I decided shooting landscapes and I really enjoy forests, outdoor activities, climbing, running, hiking, exploring is what I love. So. That's how I combined or I started transitioning a little more into travel stuff and nowadays I shoot barely any surf but more of the travel stuff which ties in really well with the travel blog as well. And then obviously venture photography, things if I can jump on a train where there's some cool athletes doing something amazing, um, I'm always in for um, some photography of that sort. Video is the future so I think I'm going to try and tell my stories from now on a lot more with video than just photo. Um, so that's about it. Question number two. How can someone who lives in a suburban neighborhood and not have the privilege to travel still provide new photos without being repetitive? You know what? Try thinking outside the box. Um, even though you have maybe a small environment, think about not, the different weathers you can capture, different locations. Think about people, think about stories, think about history, think about future, think about how ch things are changing in your area. Day and night, there's so many options to do something and make a project. And think about not just taking one photo, but think about taking making a project out of it. Think about a long-term thing, something you can document. And then I think even the smallest environment can become really interesting. So um, look into the past and see how you can connect it with the future. And I think there you will quickly find a story. Hope that answers your question. Question number three, is it possible to get the same type of images that you shoot using not so expensive lenses from Olympus? Will you ever make a video using those lenses? Um, yes and yes. So why do I use these expensive pro lenses and not the prime or the, the entry level lenses? Those lenses are weather sealed. Um, I've taken my lenses this year from plus 42 degrees in Namibia to minus 15 degrees in the Faroe Island from sandstorm to standing under a waterfall in South Africa to hail and snow last week in the Faroe Islands. So quite a range and I need my lenses to work at all times, which they do, but the prime lenses are not weather sealed and uh, entry level lenses are not weather sealed either. So yes, I would totally use the prime lenses. They're much smaller and more compact. I love being lightweight, but the weather is my biggest concern and I do not want my camera to fail on me because I have put it in an environment that the camera can't handle. So I need a camera that is capable of doing all that stuff and I do not want to worry about the equipment. So that's why I use the expensive lenses, but totally you can use more or less expensive lenses to achieve the same result. Um, I think it's a lot more in how you use your gear and not um, what gear you use. Hope that answers your question what kind of filters I use and what kind of bag I use to travel with. Um, I use the F-Stop Ajna, A-J-N-A, which is um, my favorite camera bag of all time. I've tested quite a few bags. I was fortunate with Chris Burkhardt. There was about 30 bags there hanging on the wall to test with. Uh, and F-Stop, first of all, makes my favorite bags. You can check out my gear video. I talk a little bit about it. Um, I'll blend it in now. Why does F-Stop make the best bags? They're robust, they don't look like camera bags. They make the internal ICU system, internal camera unit, which is basically a box for your camera gear that is, you can get different sizes, you just slide it in and out as you need it. 
And the Ajna backpack is the biggest carry-on compliant backpack. So it allows me to take, well, theoretically seven kilos, but mostly about 15 kilos of camera gear as a carry-on. If it's a big job, I'll split my gear, I'll check in half of my gear and I'll take the essentials with me. So worst case scenario, I can do the job with either of these kits. Filters, I currently use a whole range of filters, but I have a big set of Lee filters. I don't use filters that much, but I definitely want to get more into it. I have graduated filters, ND filters, um, love polarizers, circular polarizers. Uh, I just wrote a blog article on filters for the 7 to 14 millimeter f2.8 Pro lens. Um, check it out. I'll link that in the description below. There's many options out there and I get a lot of questions about filters for that lens. So I figured, you know what, make a list of all the stuff you know about it, all the options there are and people can, you know, figure out what works best for them. So check it out if you're into filters for that wide angle landscape lens. Any chance you have any workshops planned in the US, maybe Los Angeles? Um, no. So I'm planning to hopefully do a photography workshop in Namibia next year because I really love that place and I think there's a you know, it's a place with lots of great photo opportunities. So I'd love to take people there. Maybe the Faroe Islands, I'm thinking. I have great contacts in the Faroe Islands and I've been twice now. I know some spots that are not on Instagram. I will try and take people to the places I know that I've been to and maybe even some new ones. It's a small group thing. It's probably not the most cheap kind of workshop, but it's definitely a great way to go on an adventure and shoot a whole range of amazing photos and hopefully I can help you get those. So. That's the idea. We'll hopefully travel the world together to amazing places to take photos. So um, not coming to LA, but hopefully if you're interested, there'll be places all around the world where you can join me. Stay tuned on my workshop page for that. Battery life in comparison to Canon gear. Thinking about making the switch, but not sure yet. Thanks for your vlogs. Well, pleasure. Love doing the vlogs, love doing the videos. I have to say, I just shot like I said, we shot this adventure film in the Faroe Islands and we were basically filming all day. It was a documentary style adventure film. And we worked with two batteries per EM1 Mark II every day. And I had way too many batteries with me. I was scared. I had five EM1s and 21 batteries there. So five batteries per camera per day. And we used two. So it might not be the same capacity as one of the massive 1DX batteries, but um, they are more than capable of filming a long, long time. I'm very, very surprised and positively surprised about the battery life on the new EM1 Mark II. So if you're thinking about making a switch, I would say that's your reference. That is an absolutely amazing camera with very capable battery life. So um, yeah, nowadays I really just take two batteries with me on a day trip. But I do travel with about four batteries, well five batteries for two cameras. So two, two and a half batteries. Um, hope that answers your question. How do you feel about the 7 to 14 2.8 for Milky Way shots? Is it a bright enough? Should we go in the Voigtlander? No. So lens recommendations for Milky Way shots. I don't shoot that Milky Ways that often because I don't seem to get very lucky with bright skies. I was looking forward to it in Namibia so much. Turns out for the 10, 11 days that we were there, we had pretty much a full moon nonstop and couple of cloudy nights, so that just, you know, canceled that opportunity of shooting some of the best night skies um, ever. So kind of kind of sad about it. So probably have to go back, um, hopefully. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I, it depends. The brighter the lens, the better, you know, so for, for starscapes, you cannot have a wide open enough lens. So yes, maybe consider the Voigtlander if you're consistently shooting night skies. But for what I do, I think the 7 to 14 f 2.8 is definitely enough in my case. But I don't shoot night skies enough to, you know, give you a final answer on that. So sorry if I can't answer your question perfectly. Flash tips for studio. Um, this is maybe because I shared some studio shots I did not so long ago of my camera equipment. I'll blend some in right now. This was the first time I shot in a studio in a long time and it was just to shoot some product shots of some of the new equipment. I wanted to write some blog articles and things like that. I don't think I'll be making studio tips anytime soon. It's really not what, what, you know, what this channel is about. But if you have specific questions, feel free to email me. There's a contact form on my website. You can just email me there or chris at chrisairwalker.com where you can just send me your questions and I'll usually answer within 24 to 48 hours. How to develop your own style in photography. Nah, well, that's not difficult, but nowadays, 
there seems to be this unifying style, especially if I look at Instagram, everything is dark, moody and um, atmospheric, I would say. And we've got the vis Visco filter pack and everyone's shooting film style, uh, which is, you know, it's a nice style. I like it, but it's being overdone a little bit and people have completely lost you know, their sense of creating their own style. I was following a lot of these people and I must say I've, I've slipped into that a bit as well, especially if you're going to Iceland, the Faroe Islands, things like that, cold countries that already have a reduced color palette. Um, it's natural that you'll start shooting more atmospheric things and looking for contrast in weather and less in colors. But, you know, putting that aside, I think to me, photography is about creating a story and telling a story or um, creating a series of images. Think of not just creating one image when you go somewhere, when you're doing a project. Uh, think about, you know, how those photos can tie together. So a unifying style, I will always try and do a unifying style for a country that I go to, a project that I go to. But I reset my edit for every place and every image has its own style in a way. Uh, it's the compositions that belong together in my case more than the look of the images. Well, that's what I would say about my images. Finding your own style is something that you do over time and it develops and it changes. There's no one out there that, you know, has a consistent style from day one to day X. There's, there's, that doesn't exist. We all are influenced by what we see and what we, you know, look at on the internet and uh, in magazines and online and all those things. So I think, um, you know, your style is not necessarily your style. It's just a combination of things that have influenced you and have inspired you to do something. So, you know, copy what you see, what you like, and it'll eventually develop into your own vision. Try shooting your own compositions. Don't go out and copy paste what others have done. I know it's so easy to look at Instagram and go somewhere and travel and, and you know, go to the exact same spots, replicate the exact same shots. It's fun to do. I love doing it sometimes, you know, some places are just, you know, the one shot is there, but think outside the box, like what other shots can be taken? Be creative and you'll be way more proud about the shots that you've created there that no one else has done. Try, try to think outside the box, I would say. In this world where full frame is king, how and why do you become a micro four thirds pro photographer, especially within limitations of micro four thirds sensors? Well, I don't see those limitations as limitations. Full frame is not really king anymore. Depends on what you shoot, of course. Uh, I totally agree, there's a sp place for everything, but for me as a permanently traveling photographer, I don't own a car, I don't own an apartment, um, I don't own much really, and I basically live out of my bag as a photographer and I can set up studio or set up camp anywhere in the world because my kit is so small. If I was to shoot full frame, then this kit would probably weigh at least twice as much and I, I can travel with about 10 to 15 kilos of camera gear, which for a professional standard is actually pretty light. That includes my laptop, that includes uh, all the cables, chargers and everything. So that's really my, my whole kit, my work kit is 15 kilos. Uh, not many people that do anything for a living with material, with tools have less than 15 kilos. So it's a pretty good kit. And you know, Micro Four Thirds is small, compact. It's not intrusive when I'm traveling and shooting street. The cameras are full of technology and I think Olympus, especially Olympus, I mean, all the others are pretty good too, of course. The features packed into those cameras are one, very useful and actually thought through. They're actually, you can actually use them to do your work and improve your work too. They just work, the cameras are great. When I picked it first up, I was like, oh, this delicate little camera of technology, you know, all crammed into this little thing. But man, once I started traveling and you know, this camera got bashed around a lot and it just keeps on working. So um, yeah, that's why I love them. And I think, you know, the disadvantages you might think of are actually advantages. And honestly, the difference nowadays is not that big. Yes, you got the creamy background with full frame cameras. There's a place for that. But as a landscape photographer, not really. So I'm happy with my micro four thirds that can, you know, shoot with sensor shift up to 80 megapixels and whatnot. So I think that, you know, there's technology in the camera that makes up for what might be disadvantages and the weight and size is absolutely an advantage to my style of photography. But like I said, a place and time for every uh, style of sensor or camera size and whatnot. What do you think about the Sony A6000? I don't know, I've never used it. I have heard that it has great autofocus and that it's a really compact little capable camera. One thing that I love about Sony is that they make the sensors for almost all the cameras out there, as far as I know. Uh, even my Olympus is using a Sony sensor, so it's a bit like Apple where software is optimized for the hardware. You know, the things work really well on Sony cameras and that's why they probably get the most out of their sensors. 
So image quality wise, I think Sony might be right up there. But then having a Sony sensor in my Olympus means uh, I, I'm part, I, you know, I can get a little bit of that Sony quality combined with the Olympus technology and with Olympus innovation and size and whatnot. So it's a good balance. I think the A6000 is a very capable camera depending on what you want to do, of course. Rob is asking me, what's, what do you think is the most important factor to improve your photography? Good question. I think the most important factor to improve your photography is to shoot a lot. No one gets better by doing nothing and just looking at photos. The thing is to go out and shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot. It's digital, you can format your card afterwards, it doesn't matter. I wouldn't recommend it, but um, just shoot. Just go out there and do it. Just do it. Yeah, familiar slogan. I just spent two weeks in the Faroe Islands and I filmed more with my cameras than I have done in my entire life before. And the amount of things that I learned while using the cameras there, every single day there was progress, there was improvement, and we just got better and better and better at using these cameras. And it's all down to just using them and learning how they behave, how they work. It's the same for photography. I think we have to, you know, go out and shoot. As a landscape photographer, do you ever find yourself wishing you had more megapixels than the Micro Four Thirds system offers? New. No. Um, a lot of my images are printed in magazines, or well, a lot. Occasionally my, print, my images are printed. Occasionally I, I do an exhibition with prints huge almost a meter wide and I have never had the desire to have more detail in there they put, look perfectly fine I even at my exhibition people were saying wow these images look really crisp so it's not you know not really a problem 90% of my work goes online online doesn't care about more megapixels all you need with more megapixels is more power and more storage I don't see the value I do occasionally shoot high resolution shots with my camera which is an 18 megapixel raw file that comes straight out of the camera with the sensor moving eight times. Technology innovation, I don't even get how they can do this because it's less than a pixel than it moves. It produces amazing photos for landscapes when everything is static. As soon as things are moving too much, obviously it doesn't work because the sensor moves and we get some strange artifacts. They're getting much better at it and I think with the next generation of Olympus cameras we will see some crazy innovation in that field. Do you find yourself at a location, especially Australia, midday, harsh light, clear blue sky, how do you go about shooting your des desaturated style or do you just not bother and come back another time when the light is right? Well, I think you uh, answered your own question. I don't bother shooting in the middle of the day if I can really avoid it and I'll just come back another time. Actually, Australia is probably one of my least favorite places to shoot at. The light is just, when the light is right, it's beautiful, but that duration feels like very short winter or summer the sun just up down and you you know very seldom get a nice nice golden hour it's more like golden minutes so uh, struggle shooting in australia especially the desaturated style as you say in a place where where you know if it's golden hour everything is just covered in color so beautiful and there's many photographers in australia that have really embraced that light and really captured some beautiful colorful images but definitely i struggle with uh, capturing images like that but i'll definitely want to give it a try when i'm back in australia for a while i'll definitely you know test it out again learning by doing so going out and learning how to handle that kind of light will definitely help when i'm in different situations again i will avoid shooting in harsh light and just get up really early and stay up late where do you see yourself in five years uh where do you see photography in five years that's deep um Five years from now, I have no idea. I don't actually know where I'll be at the end of this year. So it's a bit difficult for me to say, well, you know, in five years I'll be doing this or that. Um, but I think in five years, I will hopefully be teaching more workshops all around the world, passing on my experience and knowledge, and hopefully have set up a nice base somewhere in Australia, hopefully Sydney, and, you know, just develop what I'm doing now to be bigger and more successful. Would you recommend Olympus cameras for wildlife photography? If yes, then suggest some lenses. Um, I would, especially the new EM1 Mark II. The focusing is absolutely amazing. Very capable camera. I love the crop factor. It allows us to use short lenses to zoom in quite a long way and for wildlife I think that's what we mostly want is much range as possible. And I just shot some wildlife for Olympus in Namibia. You can check out the film below as well. I've linked that as well. I shot with the 40 to 150 f2.8 Pro and a lot with the 300 f4 IS Pro lens. Both are expensive long lenses, but man, they're sharp and they're fast and they're amazing. 
and some of the features in the new EM1 Mark II with Pro Capture where it's taking photos before you push the button blows my mind. And I really enjoyed using that for wildlife, especially birds, things that are moving suddenly and really fast. You could not miss the moment with this camera, so it's a really good tool to capture wildlife. But I'm not saying that's the only camera to do it. Definitely, um, there's some other cameras that are very capable as well, so. Is your model your girlfriend or friend, or do you have, do you hire a new one at every location? Look, I can't hire everyone, anyone at new locations, um, usually friends. Most, in 99% of my photos, yes, it's my girlfriend Freya in the photos. She is wearing the yellow jacket, so yep, it's her. Who's your inspiration and where do you see yourself in 10 years? Well, I said I don't even know where I'm gonna see myself at the end of this year. Don't know where I'll be in five years, 10 years is impossible to answer. I think no one in this planet knows where they will be at 10 years, so, you know, I can only hope for things, but I don't wanna speculate, so, don't know. But my inspiration, man, there's a lot of people, uh, lots of the Australian photographers I've started after I came back from traveling again for 16 months after the internship and traveling and all that. I met some amazing photographers, uh, Luke Chark is amazing, William Patino, um, Warren Keelan, Ray Collins, amazing surf and ocean photographers, Matthew Vanderpoort. God, oh, there's so many. I wish, I wish I could remember them all. Guys out on Instagram that I keep communicating with, you do amazing work. And, you know, I, I you know, as much as I hate Instagram, I also love it. There's a, it's a great platform for meeting more and other creatives. And it might not just always be photography. So there's a great place to meet people. Obviously, there's the big guys, uh, Chris Burkhard, still follow his work. I love, uh, you know, it was a great internship with him, learning from him, and I still follow what he does. He's still a great inspiration to me um, for a 30 or 31 year old now. I think um, he's doing an amazing job and I look up to people like that. Jimmy Chin, oh, I mean, Corey Rich. Yeah, there's, there's so many people, so I, I really don't wanna, you know, reduce it down to a couple. Um, people that have done things that are off the beaten map and that are really good at what they do are inspiring to me, so yeah. Any tips on filmmaking and photography on the cheap? Photography equipment here in South Africa is really expensive. Yeah, I know, everywhere around the world it's actually quite expensive. Um, my tips would be to use what you have. It doesn't matter if your camera doesn't do 4K or isn't the best autofocus or I don't know what, it's all about going out and creating something. If you're creating, you're already ahead of the person who's just thinking about what camera they should buy next. So go out and create and think less about the gear and think about solutions and, and ways around the problems that your gear might bring. People have been creating amazing stuff for the last few years with cameras that nowadays we consider as old cameras. So yeah, just go out and create. Uh, if you're doing a Q&A, it would be great if you could cover how you started with Olympus cameras and the Micro Four Thirds system and why you still use it, prefer it. Also, what's your favorite shooting location? Okay, that's two questions. One, how do I start with Olympus? Check out my blog article, which I'll link below as well, how I became a visionary. That includes the whole history of how I started with Olympus and how I'm now an Olympus visionary. Um, I think the most important thing is that being a visionary means yes, I get the free cameras and get to work with Olympus and travel and all that, but it's not because I'm a visionary that I can do this, it's because I'm doing this and was doing this that I became a visionary. So becoming a visionary shouldn't be your goal, but your work should lead towards maybe becoming a visionary, if that makes sense. Um, just, you know, do what you love and if you do it with passion, if you do it well, and if you're, ex you know, if you're, if you're an example at what you're doing with your equipment, maybe Olympus, Sony, Canon, Nikon, whatnot, then these brands get, will get your attention and that's the way to go and not go, I would love to be a visionary so I can do this and that. Um, yeah, but check out the blog article. There's lots of the whole story in there. What's my favorite location? Planet Earth, mostly. Uh, I hate saying like people ask me, oh, what's your favorite country? Um, it's difficult. Every country is amazing. I've been to so many places in the world that are just interesting. And you know, I've found that every country basically has a good place to shoot and it's something worth documenting. So. Um, yeah, don't know. There's no favorite place. I, I'll find a good place in every country I go to and I'll make it my challenge to do so. So that's what I do. Chris, love your videos, man. Can't wait for more. Thanks, Ricky. Um, here's my question. Great. Why use a model rather than solely photos of an amazing landscape? Well, that's pretty simple. I love travel and I love to inspire people to travel and get off their couch and go traveling. Leave. The thing is, where I come from is a place where people don't really travel much. 
And I think that has encouraged me to try to inspire people to travel. That is what I try to do with my work. And I think by adding a person to a, an amazing location, first of all, it makes the location real. If I just shoot a landscape, I could, you know, it could be so amazing and beautiful that people go that this, you know, it looks photoshopped. It's, it's not real. I can't even, I can't even imagine being there. But if you put a person into a shot, it gives it scale and it puts it into perspective. It makes it attainable. And I think that's what I try to do. I, first of all, there's this, this focus point in my shots. Uh, everything will lead to the person usually. It's a person interacting with the landscape or being part of this landscape that makes it more attainable to you. So um, check out my travel photography and you'll often see a person or a silhouette of a person. And usually the person is not recognizable because I want people to imagine themselves there. So they see a lot, one of my shots, they see, wow, beautiful composition, nice place, this is amazing. And then they see a person interacting with that landscape, walking, cycling, kayak, highlining, all those things. They will often think, you know, that could be me. That's what inspires people to go to places. But I often shoot empty landscapes as well, and I have a bit of a balance. It's just that the stuff I publish is a lot of people in the shots because that's what I try to inspire people to do, so. Hope that answers your question. Does the model have a name? Yes, her name is Freya. What are your main income streams? What do you, where do you see them going in the future? As a reference, I do commercial work, image licensing, video production. I'm just living a very balanced life between making enough money to do what I love doing and continue doing so. So I'm really happy I can do that and I'm really fortunate I can do that. And I very much know that I'm a lucky person to be able to do that. Don't get me wrong, I do not make a lot of money, but I love what I do and I try, I'll do anything in the world to keep on doing this. What is my main in income stream? Well, there's plenty of things. I've realized that focusing on one thing that, you know, it might crash after a while, then you're stuck with nothing. So I try to diversify. Uh, obviously image licensing, publications, interviews, things like that. Patreon, which is a little bit of income on YouTube. Thanks to you guys. Work for Olympus, I teach workshops. I'll do projects for Olympus that pays money. Obviously I do my own workshops. I have Lightroom presets uh, that I sell online. Check those out below. Sponsored content, social media stuff. All of it, you know, is little amounts, but they obviously add up on the long run and they make it possible for me to do what I do. So yeah, don't I don't really work for money, I just, want to be able to do what I do and keep on doing it. So that's what I do. That's about it. I think, I think that's enough questions. If you managed to stay this long, then thank you for staying around. Uh, please check out all the links below. There's some cool stuff there. I hope that helps you. If you have more questions or something that I've really missed, leave a comment below. I will answer it there. And if we reach, let's say 25,000 subscribers, maybe I'll do another Q and A video. If you want to see more of my stuff that I just talked about, uh, things more behind the scenes stuff or more information in one direction or the other, let me know as well in the comments below. I will try and build it into future videos. Sorry for the lack of videos lately. Like I said, I just spent two weeks in the Faroe Islands and we were working about 14 to 16 hours a day, probably more. <laughs> so didn't really have the time to do some additional editing. And right now I'm sitting on one terabyte of footage just creating a bit more by making this Q&A video. It's just time, I have to make a video. There's one more episode of Namibia coming up for adventure photography and location. And then next week I'll be in Nepal. So yeah, crazy times ahead. Stay tuned, follow along on Instagram, Facebook, and thanks of course for subscribing here on the channel. If you do, tick the little bell icon because then you'll get a notification every time there's a new video, which means you can't miss out on anything. Thanks again for tuning in. I hope to see you next week, maybe the week after definitely in the next video. See you later. That's the coffee machine. All right. Coffee machine's done. All right, once